<clears throat> Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ana Reyes. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Amy Webb and Andrew Hessel presenting their new book, The Genesis Machine, our quest to rewrite life in an age of synthetic biology. Today's event is a part of Harvard Bookstore's Friday Forum series, which takes place on Friday afternoons during the academic year as a way to highlight scholarly books in a wide range of fields. Though we remain digital for the time being, we have a full schedule of virtual events in the coming weeks as part of this afternoon series. Check out harvard.com, forward slash events for future listings. Today's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. This event will also have auto-generated closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom that you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. If you'd like to purchase a copy of today's book, in a moment, I'll be posting a link in the chat for the Genesis machine available on our website. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like today's possible and help ensure the future of this landmark independent bookstore. Thank you all so much for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, and any book selling. We sincerely appreciate your support, especially now. And finally, as you have no doubt experience in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise, and if they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now I'm delighted to introduce today's speakers. Amy Webb is a quantitative futurist and professor of strategic foresight at NYU Stern School of Business a visiting fellow at Oxford University Said School of Business and an author of several award-winning books. She writes extensively about biotechnology, artificial intelligence, technology policy, and business strategy, regularly contributing to publications, including Harvard Business Review, The New York Times, and Wired, among others. Andrew Hetzel is a microbiologist and geneticist who has worked on the leading edge of genomics, bioinformatics, and synthetic biology. He is the CEO of Humane Genomics Incorporated, a seed stage company developing virus-based therapies for cancer, and also is a co-founder of the Genome Project Right, the international scientific effort working to engineer large genomes, including the human genome. Today, they are with us to discuss the Genesis machine, our quest to rewrite life in the age of synthetic biology. This riveting examination of synthetic biology and the bioeconomy bio provides the background for thinking through the upcoming risk and moral dilemmas posed by redesigning life, as well as the vast opportunities waiting for us on the horizon. 
Jamie Metzl, author of Hacking Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity says, this spectacular and highly accessible book clearly and thoughtfully examines the most important revolution of our lives and of life itself. And with that, we're so pleased to be celebrating this book today. The digital podium is yours, Amy and Andrew. Anna, thank you so much for that warm introduction and for hosting us today. Thanks, guys. Um, so, uh, hi, I'm Amy Webb. And before we begin, again, we'd just like to thank Harvard Bookstore for producing this series uh, virtually and in person when health, health conditions allow. I was uh, fortunate on my last book to be in person with some really thoughtful, amazing people in the store. It's a terrific store. And we're just very happy, happy to be a part of this um, virtually at this point. So Andrew, you wanna say hi, and then maybe we'll chat about the book a little bit. Hi everyone, really delighted to be here. So Andrew and I are connecting to you from separate coasts. Andrew's on the West Coast and uh, I'm on the East Coast. And so we'd just like to give you a little bit of an overview about what this book is and why we wrote it. We're gonna have a short um, overview, a little bit of a conversation, and then we'll open up uh, the digital microphone to your questions. So please do make use of the chat as you see it. So what is this book about? Um, the Genesis Machine is a book about an emerging area of technology, one that's going to allow us to edit, to redesign, potentially even create new forms of life. It's going to give us options to deal with some existential threats that are on the horizon that range from food insecurity to our climate emergency to the emergence of novel pathogens. And we believe that this technology can improve human longevity. So this field that we're covering here and that Andrew will go into more detail about is called synthetic biology. And like most people, you've probably never heard this term before. Synthetic biology basically involves redesigning organisms for useful purposes by engineering them to have new abilities. This is a relatively new interdisciplinary field of science that combines engineering, design, computer science, and other fields with biology. We think, uh, and as you're about to hear, um, that researchers are going to do some pretty amazing things once they're able to design or redesign organisms at a molecular level. Um, and it's, it's going to give us some more influence over how things in the natural world evolve. These techniques that we talk about in the book are going to make it easier for us to engineer life. And we believe that a decade from now, we'll be talking about synthetic biology the way that we talk about artificial intelligence today. Meaning, even though it's kind of a technical area, I think most people at this point have some understanding and some grasp of what AI is and why it's so important to the futures of our economy, the workforce, education, geopolitics, as we're seeing play out uh, in real time right now, um, among other things. So likewise, synthetic biology cuts across different industry sectors, different facets of our lives. And our intention with this book is to help you understand this emerging field and really start thinking critically about the implications and the potential outcomes before uh, you have to start making some decisions potentially under duress. There's a few reasons why we think this is so important right now, even though synthetic biology is on a pretty long time horizon. First of all, it's, it's taking in a ton of investment to some degree that has to do with the emergence of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. In a way, this acted as a catalyst for things like genetic sequencing, which is trying to figure out the code, the sequence of code that makes up the virus, but also synthesis, which is a way of creating and sort of producing new genetic material. Andrew will talk a little bit more about that. In effect, it kind of broke us free of the existing mental models that we had and gave us new ways of thinking about how to use biology to defend ourselves. 
all of this has attracted a whole bunch of investment. And in fact, there are some biotech veterans that raised three billion with a B dollars to create Altos Labs on the premise that the fundamental machinery of life can be reprogrammed. So there's a flood of capital uh, coming in right now to the field. So it's one reason why you should be thinking about it right now. The second has to do with the fact that technology is evolving really quickly. Um, so this is long horizon stuff, but there are some fascinating companies in this space. Twist Biosciences, uh, um, Ginkgo Bioworks, there, there's, a, there's a ton of really interesting things happening. And the technology is starting to evolve, which is great. However, there's some misalignment on regulations, which means that what's allowed in the United States is not necessarily allowed in other countries. Um, and how the investment structures work is a little bit different. One of the concerns we have is that if we can't get to alignment pretty soon, that some of the conversations that we're having today about AI or about breaking up big tech, um, they're gonna be conversations that we have in the future if we're not careful. And believe us when we say, the last thing that we want is for us to be having a conversation about breaking up big bio a couple of years from now. The third reason has to do with some imminent threats. We're gonna to have to figure out alternatives to where we get our food, where we get our fresh water, um, and where some of our raw materials come from. In addition to things like alternatives for climate change, it's really hard to get people to change their ideas. And we actually saw at the COP26 meeting last year that world leaders uh, just aren't gonna act fast enough to mitigate the climate crisis. Um, climate mitigation strategies are fine, which means trying to restrict the amount of CO2 that countries produce, but we're gonna have to also think about alternatives. And we believe that the technology that we cover in this book, synthetic biology, provides us some viable options. So there's a lot of opportunity, but there's also some risk. In fact, we detail nine different risks in the book. And that ranges from the fact that there's no global consensus on how to make decisions that will either benefit us or potentially negatively impact us on a planetary scale. Um, our regulatory frameworks are woefully inadequate, especially in the United States. This creates a strategic vulnerability and just a lot of confusion. Um, and we know that there are some places in the world, China specifically, that's endeavoring to become a global biotech superpower. And this is already creating tensions. And that was pre um, some of the events that we're seeing unfolding right now between Russia, Ukraine, and uh, how parts of the world are reshuffling a little bit. Um, and then there are some other thorny questions like, you know, is there a coming genetic divide where there may be people who have enhancements and people who don't. So the promise of this book, which is a, it's a book about science, but it's, it's a business book, it's a people book, it's not really a science book. The promise of this book is that if we can develop some of our thinking today, if we can have some of those really hard conversations today, that we can meet each other in the middle and start to think through paths forward. In this way, we think we can be closer to solutions for existential challenges. Um, and, and we can do that in a way that makes sense for everybody. This book, I keep pointing down this book, that's right here, this book. Uh, it's actually a book that is full of stories about people. Um, myself, Andrew, and our struggles to start our families. It's a story about the scientists who had to break free from the establishment to invent new technologies and some of the incredibly brave things they did. It's a story about CEOs, some of who had to learn the hard way, um, what it meant to take on a lot of venture funding and investment to, to get their biotech companies up and running. It includes stories of leaders, including presidents of various countries, pre former President Donald Trump, uh, whose DNA actually made them a security risk. But mostly this is a book about you. It's a book about your life and the decisions that you are going to have to make within your lifetime. Uh, and those decisions are gonna have consequences. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Andrew who will just give you a better understanding of what synthetic biology really is and how it works. 
Thanks, Amy. And by the way, that is just a fantastic introduction and overview of the book. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I, I never get tired of, of, of hearing that myself. Um, yeah, so coming in from the science side, um, synthetic biology, uh, I want to say right from the start, it's, it's not a great name for the technology because it's got synthetic in it. And right away, people think of things that are not natural. Synthetic biology is essentially a modern form of genetic engineering. Uh, and it is completely natural. It is using all of the natural reagents and technologies that is in every living creature on this planet from bacteria all the way to us. The synthesis part comes from, we are, we are using a technology that allows us to synthesize the DNA molecule, which is essentially the programming language for all living things. So genetic engineering originated in the 1970s. It was, uh, at, it was a remarkable technology. It was called re recombinant DNA technology at the time or gene splicing. And that's because literally the scientists had to take the DNA molecule and to make changes to it cut it and splice it together like they were splicing together physical film. So they could reorder it and edit it, uh, but it was really difficult work because you're, the scientists were editing and manipulating a molecule, which you cannot see directly. So all of the downstream testing and verification had to be done uh, as more experiments. With synthetic biology, we started to digitize this work, just like we've digitized film editing and music editing, et cetera, and word processing. We started to sequence DNA using a machine that, that took the chemical letters of DNA and digitized them, made them a file on a computer. We developed software tools to be able to do a manipulation like with a word processor to cut, Re, de, to delete, to add, uh, and, and, and manipulate in general, move things, blocks around. But the really, the, the really new part, and the part that makes this more accessible and really speeds things up, is now once we've finished our manipulations using computer software, we can hit print. And the, a new DNA molecule is synthesized, and ultimately that allows us to quickly and uh, move into the lab for loading those new genetic programs into cells and to start the, the testing and verification processes that we'd be doing downstream on our application development. So really the short, to condense that, it's genetic engineering done in with digital tools, much faster, much more accurate, much cheaper to do, much more accessible to do because it's now being done with software. This is, um, uh, this is revolutionizing life science. Uh, it, it's bringing together not just the, the, the ability to do things faster, but to work collaboratively on, on projects because with digital tools, many people can come and work on the same file annotate it, uh, et cetera, comment it. It allows for digital biosecurity processes for screening anything that's being produced. Um, and overall, uh, it, it, it's just making it so much more accessible. Uh, we're seeing this come bottom up. The, the size of the program that we create with, with these technologies roughly correlates to the complexity um, so the more DNA you can write, the more complex program, essentially. Uh, and right now, our DNA printers are in this sweet spot where we can make any protein. And proteins have, are, can either be structural materials in biology, or they can be catalytic materials in biology, building something up or breaking something down. Those are enzymes. Um, so, uh, and, and they can also have sensing ability as well. So protein engineering is, is accelerating so quickly that it's just opening up brand new areas of development. As our DNA synthesis technologies have increased, we've started to actually write the complete genomes 
of, of uh, microorganisms working from smallest genomes up. Today, virtually every virus could be synthesized on demand. Um, and now we're starting to move into microbial genomes that are millions of base pairs of DNA code long, allowing us to build organisms from scratch and, their, and program their complete metabolism. And again, this technology is always moving faster, better, cheaper, like anything digital. So we can pretty much see the pace of development moving from millions of base pairs of synthesized DNA up to uh, billions of base pairs of synthesized DNA, which pretty much opens up the entire world of plants and animals uh, uh, as well. So that's, um, that's probably the best overview. I can say that yeah. this is a technology that you can start to access with little more than a laptop because some of the newest labs coming online uh, are, are essentially cloud laboratories uh, or biofoundries where you don't have to have the physical laboratory. You can program a robotic laboratory to do the design and engineering work that, that you hope to do. So I know that when people hear um, genetic engineering or laboratory or a lab grown fill in the blank that, you know, that really doesn't sit well with a lot of people. Um, I think the important thing to bear in mind is that most of the work being done in this field is about optimizing. Um, and and uh, genetic engineering uh, is not necessarily bad, but sometimes the stories, in fact, we have a chapter that begins with, with a really interesting story rooted in science fiction that you will probably recognize, but has a different ending than you probably remember. You know, the stories that we've, we've been told for so long are about the sort of catastrophic outcomes. And, you know, we absolutely think that there are some potential dangers ahead. And we have solutions in the book for how to mitigate those dangers. But what we want people to do, and the whole point of this book is to get people to have an open conversation about this. Before you say no, because it smacks against your current cherished beliefs, we want you to lean in with curiosity and say, I'd like to know a little bit more. You can still say, you can get to the end of this book. And, and after we've uh, advocated for multi-parent children um, or, or some of the other things that are probably going to challenge you as you read this, but are very much rooted in data and existing evidence and science, you can get to the end and still shake your head and say, this is not for me. That's fine. But by the end of this book, you're going to know all of the science that is currently in development and some that's already out there, then you'll just be better informed. For example, um, can I talk about JCVI uh, sin maybe 1.0? Um, so, so we describe an organism in this book that is digitally watermarked. Now, when scientists are creating the new organisms that you heard Andrew describe, sometimes, or most of the time, they'll put in sort of a digital watermark and it's just, it's just extra code. And the point of this is to let others know that this one has been modified. Well, um, one of the stories that we tell is of a, of a really, really cool maverick scientist uh, who is developing this sort of minimum viable genome. And in the middle of all this, um, they insert this digital watermark. But it turns out that the watermark that they used was a quote from a portrait of the art of an artist, portrait of the artist as a young man from James Joyce. And the quote is to live, to err, to fall, to triumph, to recreate life out of life. So it's like very apt, except that the Joyce estate went is like super litigious. And when they found out that somebody had like some crazy scientist had scraped a Joyce quote and shoved it into a teeny tiny organism, you know, like they were quite displeased. But uh, the point is, first of all, this is the first time that an organism has existed whose parents technically were computers. Secondly, we don't have a current legal framework to send a cease and desist letter to a, to a microorganism, right? There's no address that you can send it to. Um, and the point that we're making here is these are the, like, I know that your minds are immediately going to designer Aryan babies. We know that. 
But this book is not about that. This book is about asking the more nuanced questions that we ought to be asking. And it's about opening up our minds to the possibility that we all might evolve a little differently. And if you can open your mind to these weird potential risks and challenges, but also a, a different construct for how life might evolve, to change your perception um, is really a magical thing. And it's gonna give you, a, I think, a better idea of, of what's happening right now, but what could be in the future. Should we maybe talk about some of the current use cases for this tech? I, I think that would be really appropriate. Absolutely. You wanna... I, I, think, yeah. I, think, I think what people need to understand here is that, you know, the previous generations and current generations are programming computers and we've changed the world with these systems. This is literally starting to program uh, cells to do meaningful and useful things. And, and again, hey, can people I interrupt immediate... you for, can I interrupt? Cause, Cause like, I'm sure there's people who are like, that makes no sense to me. So, so, <laughs> <laughs> so in computer world, we've got binary, we've got ones and zeros and in, biology world, we've got ACTG. So can you maybe just like super high level, do it for our parents understanding, like what does yeah. this mean to program, to like write biological code? What do you talk, that sounds insane. Well, it, it, it's, it's a lot like software engineering. With software engineering, you have to write code. That code is, is compiled, so it's understandable by a computer processor, and it runs, it, it directs what the processor does. And the application space is, of course, nearly unlimited. Just go to the app store. It's very similar with when programming cells, except cells don't manipulate just electronic in data they're actually manipulating mo molecules in the real world. But in, in programming it, you still have to understand the programming language, compile the program into DNA, get the DNA loaded into the cell, which is like the computer, but now it's computing molecules and it is literally starting to build molecules. Uh, whether it's proteins, whether it's other systems to build other molecules, because molecular systems are all, are all daisy chained. And after that, it's like, why are you reprogramming? It's going into applications. One of the earliest applications that I ever worked with was the, a company that was developing drugs, protein based drugs that were literally life saving. They were small programs, peptide hormones. So absolutely the world of medicine is accessible through, through synthetic biology. The, the mRNA vaccines that we many of us have had with, with, with COVID uh, to essentially halt COVID uh, were one of the largest use cases ever of these technologies because the, the mRNA vaccine is literally programmed and put into, in this case, we skip the cells and we use cell-free system to make it at scale. There are other groups that have appeared to make uh, essentially flavors and fragrances. Biofuels have been a giant first application. Many of the groups out of the gate started to work with, with um, uh, essentially reagents that wouldn't need to be FDA approved to go into the marketplace, but would go into the industrial processing Route. So, for example, building blocks for various cosmetics, uh, uh, biofuels being a big example, a lot of investment went there, but it's, that was a tricky one because it's actually hard to turn, have biology produce fuels cheaper than you can extract the biology that has been done in the ground for millions of years <laughs> to produce them. Um, and, and so, but those are the largest categories kind of out of the gate fuels, fragrances, high value specialty industrial chemicals, uh, building materials, uh, whether it's because we use a lot of natural building materials uh, to create the world around us, whether it's wood, the leather jacket you're wearing, uh, the cotton jeans that we are, that we are using, and medicine being a, a really significant market, as well as uh, R&D, which is we use these tools in the lab. So it creates a self uh, accelerating essentially framework 
and it gets faster, better, cheaper to do the research, which produces more applications, and the technology stack that we need for actually doing this work. All of these are really big application areas. I'd love to give an example that might hit a little bit closer to home. Um, so the Super Bowl was just a couple of weeks ago, and Americans ate 1.45 billion chicken wings, which is a staggering amount of chicken that we all consumed at the same time in like the span of the same six hours. Um, so what does it take to produce that many chicken wings? Well, you need like 750 million or so chickens, and those chickens all have to be uh, commercially farmed. And to get that many chickens that big, that fast requires a lot of resources. You need feed, uh, you need water, you need hormones and antibiotics to, to plump them up and keep them alive. The end result is, you know, a cheap scalable chicken wing, but one that's arguably not so great for the planet. Um, probably not so great for you. Definitely not so great for the chickens. Um, you know, so what if a couple of years from now, uh, there's a Super Bowl, and at that Super Bowl, everybody's consuming the exact same amount of chicken wings or even more, but the chicken uh, was grown instead in what's called a bioreactor. So imagine a giant pressure cooker uh, that you would, you would take stem cells from, let's say, a heritage chicken that is full of deliciousness and none of the hormones and none of the antibiotics. And you put that into a bioreactor along with some delicious amino acids and you keep it nice and warm, just like it would be in the mother hen. Um, and then in a relative, you know, short amount of time relative to what it would have taken to grow an actual chicken, you have the meat. Um, and this meat didn't require the hormones or the antibiotics because it wasn't part of a commercial farm. You didn't need all that water. You didn't need all of the feed and the fertilizer and everything else. And now you've got chicken meat that, that can scale and you don't need just a handful of chicken farms. You could theoretically have bioreactors everywhere. Now I know this sounds like the distant future, but in fact, in Singapore, that very meat has already gone on sale. And it took two years to get through their regulatory process, but um, you, you can buy chicken uh, that, that was never attached to a living, clucking, breathing, actual chicken. And it tastes like chicken. Now the portion sizes, like it, it's expensive kind of. So it's like $17 right now for a portion, which is a far cry from a 10 cent wing. But the thing that we're trying to get everybody to remember is that this is the beginning. This is a long horizon technology and we're at the very beginning stages of it. So it's totally plausible that a handful of years from now, we would be eating ethically sourced, uh, you know, humanely produced, much healthier chicken. Um, and it doesn't require, it doesn't require those huge commercial farms. It also doesn't require a cold chain um, or some of the other processes that are in place to move chicken around like that. Now, Andrew and I, you've already heard him say it, and you're going to hear me say it again, synthetic biology, we understand from a scientific point of view why that label is used, but in terms of public communication, it's probably not the right term. And also, synthetic biology, much like AI, is kind of an umbrella term for different technologies. The best way to think about this chicken on the horizon chicken that you, if you go to Singapore, you can eat now is not lab grown chicken, right? Um, first of all, it's not grown in a lab. It is grown in a commercial facility, just like your other chickens are grown in a commercial facility. It's not grown in a, somebody's, you know, some mad scientist's lab. It's just different. Um, and if this was a different area of business, we would call this innovation and we would be comfortable with that. But because this crosses into the life sciences, we talk about, we don't call this innovation. You know, we call this something different. Um, it's change. And most people don't like the idea of change. So again, the science is moving. We're the ones that need to start adapting our mental models so that we can both address the risks, but also reap the rewards. Um, so it's, I just want to be mindful of everybody's time. It's 9.35 where Andrew is. It's 12.35 where I am. We would love to answer any questions that you might have. So if you see the bottom of your screen, you can type those in for us. Um, but 
maybe as you're doing that, Andrew, can I, can I ask you about the super weird, but I think super interesting use case that has to do with uh, Roswell technologies and, and semiconductors? Oh, since that's yeah. kind of in the news right now. Roswell Biotechnologies is a company that has been at the very forefront of, of essentially making cyborg chips for, for electronics. They are, it's the intersection of semiconductor technology and, and, and biomolecules. So they've been, they've essentially made a computer chip, which today has features down at the nanoscale and they've attached biomolecules to it, including, uh, uh, you can, you can put almost anything on these, but they've been putting enzymes on it and various proteins like antibodies as sensors. Um, and it is changing the, the way we are able to detect and sense the, the, the nanoscale machinery in biology by connecting it directly to the nanoscale machinery we've developed for computers. This opens the potential of down the road your cell phone having a DNA sequencer, for example, or your, the cell phone being able to sense a virus in, that's in your vicinity the same way uh, it, a cell might detect it by actually getting infected. Um, so just a remarkable technology. About a month ago, they, they published a paper in a journal called PNAS describing their, their first molecular electronic chip. And I think this is going to be the foundation of, uh, uh, of an entire fast moving industry of cyborg electronics. Yeah, it, there's literally, I mean, we kind of, I think we referenced Ro Roswell in the book, but the announcement just happened. Um, and it's a semiconductor chip that is, that is uh, it's, it's smaller than a fingernail and it can grab an individual molecule and read it. Um, and this is important especially given the current geopolitical crisis that's unfolding uh, in front of us, you know, um, there are microchips in just about everything. So at the moment, a lot of our computing technology is restricted or constrict, it's constrained by the current architecture that we have. And if you're familiar with Moore's law, um, which describes the rate of change as uh, compute gets smaller and components Compute gets larger and components uh, get smaller and, and cheaper. At some point, you know, how, how, how much more does that scale continue to work um, without starting to change and address the architecture? So that's kind of the other interesting thing here is if we start to think about computing in a slightly different way, you know, um, that opens up all of these possibilities. So this chip, this weird biological molecular microchip it's got 16,000 sensors um, and each one can latch onto a different molecule and decode DNA. And we know that this sounds, again, like it, it's, this is hard. I'm not a scientist. This is hard for me to just conceptually wrap my, my mind around, but this is also not fringy science. Microsoft has an entire division, Microsoft, that at the moment is trying to sort out how to store information inside of DNA, how to make it computable in a, in a different way. And Google has entire divisions that are looking at uh, how to sequence, how to synthesize, what to do with some of this biological information. So what we're trying to help everybody understand is that this coming era that we're looking at is, is sort of the next era of, of biology and technology intertwining um in new ways and that that really does start to reshape how we interact with the machines how we think of ourselves as machines i mean in a way we're kind of just squishy robots um walking around and, and we don't you know a lot of us don't have any have any understanding of how the machinery in our own bodies works um i am seeing here that we've got a ton of questions so let me you know, I, speaking of biology, one question we get asked all the time is what enhancement would you make? And I've changed my mind now that we're on virtual book tour. I would like to have the uh, progressive lenses that are in my glasses be in my eyes and have like a super magnifying because I can't see this text. I'm going to try. What are some of the ways in which this technology could be used to combat aging? Could this be used on dogs and pets so that they live longer? So 
two questions there, aging and then also pets. Andrew, why don't you take the pets question first, since that's an area you know a lot about, and then we'll flip over to aging. Yeah, so so uh, it's interesting. Dogs live, you know, in fast motion compared to compared to us. You know, essentially seven dog years, approximately, for one human year. Um, it's it's pretty. Um, the short version is, yeah, I think that we are going to see these technologies be applied to companion dogs. That's the dogs that live with us, not research dogs. Um, very quickly in the aging space because we are making rapid progress to understand the process of aging in, in, in the lab, but we have the largest barrier uh, ethically and morally to applying it to ourselves because we have to be very, we're very conservative about what we do to human beings. Um, I think dogs are going to lead the way in a lot of the, the application development uh, for health, for longevity, uh, and, and for treatment of, of diseases like cancer, uh, which dogs are quite prone to. Um, and then as we get better and more experienced with the dogs, I think it will translate also to, to cats and other pets. So the question on aging um, is answered in this, chap this chapter. So in the middle of the book, uh, we've written what are called speculative scenarios. So Andrew's a scientist, I'm a social scientist, and what I do for a living is use data to model next order outcomes. So those are called strategic scenarios. The middle of the book is that they're, they're a collection of strategic scenarios, kind of like short speculative fiction stories, except all rooted in data and evidence. Um, and they explore the recently plausible. So given what we know to be true today, what could the future look like? We're not making predictions. Um, as somebody who models for a living, uh, the, the math doesn't work out. So we're, we're not making predictions here. We're just exploring what might be. One of the things that we explore is uh, chapter 11 and it's called, what happened when we cancel aging? So this entire chapter goes into the science of what it might look like for us to think of aging as a pathology that could be treated. And you know what happens if we are living relatively healthy lives for 120, 130 years, and at the very, very, so we have a very long healthy life and the end is very short um, and, and we can alleviate suffering. So what might that look like? And I know that that sounds exciting, however, there are some next order consequences to think about, such as, you know, what happens if a Supreme Court justice is on the bench for 80 years because they have life appointments? Or what happens if uh, some of our senators who are not term limited, you know, serve uh, many, many, many decades and amass, you know, unquestionably enormous amounts of power? There are some also, you know, other questions like if you're in a family business with, you know, what is a what does succession planning look, look like if you now have multiple generations of family members leading, you know, and, and some of them refuse to retire? I don't want to spoil the story here, but since you're in Boston, most of you, um, and I'm originally from Chicago and we come from baseball towns, um, uh, one of the things that I was curious about is, well, what happens if the 2016 uh, World Series winning Chicago Cubs kind of got back together and just kept going. Um, and, and the outcome of that is, is actually not great. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot to think about in terms of, of aging. Um, there's a great question here for you, Amy, right yeah. off the start. It, it says, you know, are, be, are you able to speak about the kinds of regulations that would, that would need to be put in place that allow us to reap the benefits of this kind of technology? Yeah, so this is something that's gonna be really tricky because Part of the problem in the United States is that our regulations are somewhat, they're, they're applied somewhat inconsistently, and that has to do with politics. So the regulatory framework in the US is governed by something called the, the um, my brain is co coordinated, <laughs> it's not consolidated, it's a coordinated framework. Basically, there's three different divisions. Um, there's EPA, there's USDA, and there's FDA. And for the most part in the US, we regulate the products, not the process. 
And that makes sense because we want to preserve innovation and the ability for our science community to continue doing their science. We don't want to tamp down on that too much. However, it's really challenging to enforce uh, some of the rules that we have. And also, we're not doing this in an incremental way. So as usual, we've got technology outpacing our ability to really think through regulations. But unlike areas like artificial intelligence, which by the way, is it, this is the same type of problem there. When it comes to AI, we don't have some of the moral and religious questions that pop up when we're talking about biology. So when we had uh, President Obama, there was, um, you know, we've got some stem cell lines, we've got uh, some agreements on how to manipulate, um, you know, uh, how to treat embryos, how to manipulate life, things like that. Um, and there was a bit more openness at that point when President Trump came in, you know, we reversed course and suddenly we weren't going to be doing that type of research anymore. For some scientists, their projects were, you know, that they had to stop working basically overnight. And it's not just whether or not you can or cannot do certain things, it's also funding. So in the US, we don't, unfortunately, our science research is tethered to politics, which I think makes us incredibly vulnerable um, and also makes it super hard for researchers. Like some of these scientists are doing what's called basic research, right? This is just researching for the sake of developing new knowledge, which we need to do and we should be encouraging, but it takes a really long time. So if we don't have consistency and we don't have a consistent long-term plan or vision for what all of this looks like that can withstand uh, politicking uh, and a change, you know, a changeover in the White House, then we're going to keep coming back to the same argument over and over and over again. That creates, I think, a strategic disadvantage and makes us vulnerable at precisely the time that some of our <clears throat> adversaries, in this case, China, um, doesn't, doesn't take the same approach. Uh, and, and that opens, you know, the China to be working in a very different way, open, opens them up. So I, I think that this, um, I, I think we're going to have to figure out a way to deal with regulations, which is going to mean, again, let's have a reasonable conversation where the immediate answer is either no or we must, right? Um, Andrew brought up recombinant DNA at the very beginning, and the bookend, the end of this book actually starts at Asilomar. Um, just after that recombinant DNA discovery was made. And what's so cool about what happened at that meeting in the 70s was that the scientists who worked on this project brought others together, they brought other scientists together, um, but they also invited journalists and ethicists. They had this, um, this invite only, but very open meeting. And the point of this was to discuss, you know, in what ways might we be able to use this technology it was a brilliant move and one that resulted in the technology being able to flourish with guardrails. And on top of everything else, you can Google this later because it will absolutely blow your mind, but um, Rolling Stone did a whole story, a multiple page story. So in the same, um, the same Rolling Stone magazine that features the kinks, there's like uh, Stevie, there's a Stevie Wonder on the cover, he's wearing like cool psychedelic clothing. It's an illustration of him. You flip a couple pages in, it's James Watson and a bunch of schlubby scientists standing outside of a conference center talking. Um, so that's what we need. I, I, I have a hard time imagining what that might look like in the year 2022 when we are so politically, just, the politics are all over the place right now. I'm hoping that we figure out a place to, to come together on and, and be able to have some of these conversations not just the scientists, um, but the scientific community along with everybody else. We do this in a thoughtful way. There's, a, there's a, another question here, Amy, uh, um, if we could elaborate a little on this technology and, and, uh, and in the light of the COVID epidemic, oh. how would synthetic biology fit into the current discussion of epidemiology? Uh, you know, I, I'm gonna take this one. Yeah. It, it was, we felt it was really, um, amazing uh, to write this book during a pandemic when this technology was really being thrust onto the global stage 
uh, to address vaccine making. Um, number one, the technology for reading DNA is how we've been actually tracking the variants. It's the, 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 the just sensing the virus, the, the PCR tests that we've been doing, the, the rapid tests that we've been doing, all of these are developed with these, with these, uh, with synthetic biology or or closely related technologies. Um, so just the fact that we have rapid diagnostics and the ability to detect variants down to the base pair level uh, is, is really based on this technology. More than that, the mRNA vaccines that that were developed in record time, nine months basically, start to finish. Uh, it was done only because of these, sec these synthetic tech technologies being available to the researchers and drug companies to, to really advance this product. So the, you know, the, book is, the book has some history, but the present day was really written you know, uh, through the pandemic. And it was a turning point for this technology that, again, Amy already mentioned, has, has just driven a massive amount of new investment into the field moving forward. In last year, more money was invested in synthetic biology technologies than in the previous decade. Um, and not all of it going into medicines. In fact, the biggest, uh, the biggest area was, was foods um, and not synthetic foods, but basically starting that you can look at it as cellular agriculture, learning how to how to take these, uh, um, uh, learning how to manipulate uh, uh, cells to to become better foodstuffs or additives to go into the systems that are natural rather than being synthesized. Um, so yeah, so COVID really put this technology onto a global stage. I would just add there, because we, I, I mean, we're getting a lot of questions about COVID and messenger RNA. And, um, you know, it, I think it's given us an opportunity to, ex, to make some of this more accessible. Um, three years ago, nobody was talking about messenger RNA. Nobody was talking about DNA. I think three years of, if you had gone back three years, I'm not sure that the average person would have remembered enough from high school biology class you know, to, to really even tell you what DNA or a virus for that matter was. And in a way, COVID has given us this opportunity to explore much more deeply how all of these things and these systems work. One of my favorite things that Andrew writes in the book um, is that, you know, a virus is really just a container for code. And he's got a wonderful analogy. You want to give the, I don't want to. Oh, I just, I just say viruses are USB sticks. Uh, they're literally, I would say floppy disk, but that would just be, <laughs> no one uses this anymore. But, <laughs> but it's basically, but it's basically <laughs> how, how, how cells pick up new code. And, and so viruses uh, have a beneficial effect in driving evolution, as well as, as you know, being very self-serving, let's make more viruses uh, and sometimes damaging, but they're, uh, the the number of viruses that actually cause harm to us uh, is, is a small fraction of the billions of viruses that exist in nature. Basically, every cell in nature, plant, animal, or bacteria, has a relationship with at least one virus. <laughs> yeah, and I will I will also just say, we you know I would it's probably because of COVID that we wound up with a ninth risk. That the ninth risk in the book is misinformation. There's an entire chapter devoted just to what happens when misinformation about biology spreads. And that chapter of the book concerns something called golden rice. And it is a absolutely heart-wrenching story of scientists who, who had a, a really great idea and had the best intentions for society. And because of some poor decisions, to be fair, that they made, um, but mostly because of misinformation that 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 it never like the technology that the product which was the rice um, it it got destroyed. So uh, we we cover misinformation because we watched during COVID, you know, we we watched the, the story unfold and and just how challenging it was for people and and then on top of like, like this is heady hard stuff for anybody to understand. And then rather than making room for people who, 
you know, we're skeptical, which totally makes sense. Um, we berated them, right? So we, we wound up with this crazy polarized situation where it became like, you, you couldn't ask any questions because the very act of asking a question made people think that you were a vaccine skeptic or a COVID spe you know, skeptic. And this whole thing spiraled out of control. We don't want that to happen again for all the reasons that we already know, um, which is why, you know, the, the misinformation risk got its own chapter because in some ways that's the most perilous and the most dangerous of all the risks. So it looks like we have maybe one time for one more question, unless you wanted to. And I'm happy to read this. Yeah. It, it, wouldn't this technology further the divide between social classes? It sounds like it's something that could only, that only wealthy or some people would have access to. I, I, I'd love to tackle a little bit yeah. of this. Um, this tech, we're pretty familiar with digital technologies getting faster, better, cheaper. You know, um, they start off expensive, but as we ramp up the manufacturing, suddenly it's available to almost everyone at a good price. And the, the key example here is just the mobile phone. Once uh, in the 1980s, super elite, not very functional today, uh, just about everyone. There's more mobile phones out there than people. Um, biology is absolutely the cheapest form of manufacturing. It literally builds itself. And as we get better at programming it, um, it, it, it just gets faster and cheaper to do. Um, so I think at the beginning, there is certainly a divide because uh, on when technologies are new, they're very expensive, they're high risk. Um, but this biotechnologies in general look to become extremely inexpensive if we can avoid the some of the market distortions that we've seen for example in insulin which we describe in detail in the book so that will come as the, as more people and more competition uh, and just more r d is done uh, over the over the years but there's no reason why biology can't be the most powerful and the least expensive technology we have available today that's right and we have Andrew and I have yet to meet a scientist who doesn't think that the science should be distributed, right? So this is about market forces. And in at least the United States, the invest, you know, we're gonna have to figure out a way to make this stuff equitable because we we warn about this. We don't want a future where we have the next, you know, social divide, the next divide is not digital but genetic. We don't want that to happen. And we think that there's there's an opportunity now to plan, but we have to plan, right? The best possible futures do not show up wrapped you know, neatly and tied with a bow. They require work. And in some cases they require making difficult political decisions. We have an opportunity now to make those decisions and to fulfill the dreams that we know all of these scientists have, right? To, to make us more comfortable, to give us better, longer, healthier, happier lives and to, to meet some of the challenges that we currently have. But that requires planning. And you can't just intend to plan, you have to do it. And, and doing that planning requires knowledge, it requires an open mind, and it, it requires conversation. And that is what we hope that you will do next. It's why we wrote the book. And it's why we hope that you don't just read it. We don't want you to read it. I mean, we want, obviously, <laughs> please buy, like, buy many copies of the book. We want you to read it. Um, we want you to talk about it. That's what we want. Uh, we want you to read it. We want you to go have a conversation with somebody and encourage them to have a, you know, to allow your minds to wander productively, um, but to keep your minds open. We really are relying on you um, because all of this stuff is coming, whether or not we feel like we want it to, it's coming. So we're relying on you to get it educated now and, and to be able to have some thoughtful conversations. Awesome. Thank you once again, Amy and Andrew, for this incredibly engaging conversation. We're so happy to have you. And thank you to everyone out here for spending your afternoon with us. Um, please grab a copy of Genesis Machine in-store or online at Harvard Bookstore. Um, and on behalf of us here at Harvard Bookstore in snowy Cambridge, Mass today, keep reading, stay safe, and be well, and have a lovely rest of your weekend. Thank you guys so much. Thanks. Anna. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.